Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Our next guest is an award-winning writer. He is a showrunner for HBO's hit series, Insecure, and recently he directed the Netflix uh, movie, Uncourt. Please let me welcome the accomplished Prentice Penny. Welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going, man? I'm doing well. I know we're all going through this quarantine and trying to stay home. How's it going for you and your family? Uh, I mean, we're alive, man, so that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, that's all you can ask for, to be perfectly honest right now, man. It's like, you know, everybody's alive, everybody's okay. That's facts. So I'll, I'll take that right now, man. Yeah. I know they said uh, California's thinking about opening up uh, on Friday. How comfortable do you feel going back out there? Uh, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> not, not at all. Me I'll let somebody else be the experiment, man. I'm going <laughs> to just try to see how those first couple of weeks go. And then yeah, exactly. By that, you know what I mean? I have, I have three kids, so yeah. I'm, I'm more so concerned about my wife and the three kids than anything else. So like I said, I, I kind of wait and see how it plays out. I feel you. They opened up Georgia uh, last week. I said, I, know, I saw they can do that. They can, they got that. They got that. <laughs> well, before, before we go into um, insecure and, and uncork, let's talk about your career. How'd you get started in the industry? Um, well, I went to, uh, I mean, like the short version is I went to uh, USC. I went to film school at USC and, uh, you know, graduated, you know, didn't get the, didn't get a bunch of offers to do a bunch of stuff. You know, I, I was writing, but, you know, I had to get a job like a lot of people. I, I, you know, tried to make little things here and there. I worked in, worked at Walt Disney in the theme park division and I, I kind of bounced around doing different things, wrote music videos for directors and um, you know, finally, I was sort of was like, I always knew I went to write in TV. I was just kind of pretty intimidated by it because, you know, different than when you write a movie where you can kind of write by yourself. I, right, yeah. in, in TV, you're kind of in a writer's room with a lot of people. Yep. And, and I was a little bit afraid of like, what if I'm not good enough? What if I'm not funny enough? What if I'm not this enough? So, so for me, it was, um, and then again, I was delaying the inevitable, which was kind of where I wanted to be. Um, so at the time, my very first job was like, now I don't even know if the program still exists, but what I would say the closest thing would be like a diversity hire okay. on television shows where yeah. I, was, uh, uh, I got a job on Girlfriends working under Amara Brachakia. But again, that was nine years after graduating college. So it wasn't like- Right, uh, overnight success. You know, yeah, it, it yeah. wasn't like that at all. So, um, and, 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 but, but, like, but that was sort of where I got my first start is like a diversity hire. Then inevitably she hired me as a full-time writer. So that was the, the entryway around 2004. Most definitely. And what made you not give up? I mean, nine years after graduating, you know, most people are like, okay, well, it's time to get, do something else. What made you stick with it? Uh, I mean, it was just my dream, you know what yeah. I mean? And so, you know, I had a good wife that was like, there's no plan B. We're just going to try to hit plan A. Um, yeah. I didn't have, I didn't have any fallback skills. Like <laughs> I went to college, <laughs> right. I, went, I got a degree in, in cinema. So I was yeah. like, I don't, I don't even have like a law degree or a med or a business degree to fall back on to be like, well, I just kind of do this in the meantime. Like I didn't have any other choices. Right. Like, yeah. You know, you, you, you can't really politic a film degree into to, a, to like to be a lawyer. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it was hard, obviously, you know, it was difficult. Um, and there are times where you're watching other people get shots and you're like, you know, you're happy for them, but you're also like, man, when's my time? Right. You know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like inevitably it was just God and, right. uh, you know, good, you know, good support system. And, and my, my family never tried to like dissuade me, yeah. you know, once I graduated. So, so that was obviously big help. I didn't really have to face any, like, you got to get a job. Like, I right. wasn't asking them for money. So it wasn't like, I was just broke kind of on my own. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I would say you know, prayer and patience, man. Yeah. So once you landed girlfriends, um, how did your career take off from there? Uh, well, I was on that show for four seasons okay. uh, till until the show ended with, with uh, as a result of the writer strike in '07, and then um, after that point, I was just kind of like they had canceled a lot of black shows. Um, yeah. At that time, and so I think the only show that kind of still stayed around was like The Game with Mars, other show The Game, and that was I think really it. And so I mostly worked on white shows really until Insecure. I mean, I just was like, that. those were the shows that were around. Um, and, you know, I, I got, that was what I realized too, was like, at the time, it's not like, it's not like this now, but like back then, a lot of white people weren't aware of the black shows that were on the air. It's not like right. now where like, where like white people know what Atlanta is, white people exactly. know what black is, white exactly. people know what Insecure is, or dear white yeah. people. Back then it was like, oh, you're on the CW or you're on UPN or the WB, we don't really mess with that. That's like the Negro leagues. And so yeah. a lot of ways, I would realize that like, oh, the white shows were like, the black shows were, were, were treated like the Negro leagues in baseball and that white people were the major leagues. And then, um, 
so yeah so i just i just realized that and so it was again i had to just play in that space um, right so but what i realized is like once you're in that world they they all know each other so like i would got on like one show and even though that show was like i got on it once i left girlfriends i was on this show called do not destroy which is actually how i met nisi nash but that show was like we did three episodes and we were canceled but even though that show was like a complete flop, the people that were in that room could validate me to more white people. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so they that's were like, true. oh, Brent, like, Prentice is smart. Yeah. And then when I got my next show, they would call that show and be like, because they would all have work together on other shows. And that's when you go like, oh, that's how this game kind of works. The politics and, and even the networking though, really. But yeah, the, the yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just like if you were in, you're in a room with like millionaires, with well, millionaires, no other millionaires. You know right. what I mean? And yeah. So, so you're just like playing in a different pool. That's what I just realized, you know? And so that's sort of what happened after that. So like I was on Do Not Disturb and then that took me to Scrubs and then the writers on Scrubs, then one of the EPs on that show was gonna run Happy Endings. So that took me to that and then Happy Endings was good. And then like, as a result of that, that got me on Brooklyn Nine-Nine and then meeting people on Brooklyn Nine-Nine is what got me on Insecure. So it's like- Okay, it gets, yeah, yeah. All like kind of like doing this. And so, um, but that's what I realized, yeah. Most definitely. How hard would you th do you say would you say it is for someone, you know, trying to get in the game today? How hard would it be? Because, you know, it is about, again, networking, and having those circles that you feel comfortable working in. How is it? How hard is it breaking into that circle? Um, I mean, I would say today it's a, I would say it's probably a little easier in that one. Um, you have actually like black people. You have a, certainly more black shows and I yeah. you have certainly more black um showrunners running those shows right um right. and so there's less um and the access to get to people is much easier like when i was coming up there's no social media so right like, yeah so like you can tweet at isa and she can respond to you yeah it just didn't exist back yeah. then you know yeah. what i mean so like i was saying like not that it, it's always hard i mean breaking in is always hard that's why not everybody breaks in but right. I think I think the access to get to people, the sort of like deconstruction of like the gatekeeper to get in is much yeah. more difficult. The the like now they make TV shows year round, as opposed to when I was coming up in the beginning where you had a TV cycle. So like exactly. they made, like there was like they'd make shows you know from June to March, and then there was no summer programming. There was no there was no there reruns was, reruns yeah, reruns. Yeah, like, people don't yeah. really know what reruns are now. Like there was no streaming back then so like there was like there's just so many more ways to view content and also like there and there's so many more acceptable ways that content gets viewed like you can do a you can have a little web thing and be on quibi and have yeah. like a little 10 minute show or a web show like and right like, pop you yeah. off. so like there's just different avenues now that just didn't exist in so i think you're the way you get in it opens up i think what gets what is what you lose on that is like people eyeballs to your thing because there's so much now that like back then it was like you know everybody you only had like you had hbo and you had showtime but really right. you had like channel you know you had abc nbc fox and yeah, cbs exactly you know but you didn't but now everybody it's crazy. Content, exactly so yeah. it's like so yeah. i think you so what kind of gets sacrificed in that is like it's great that there's more avenues but then what you kind of lose is like this idea that like a show will go on for like eight years like nine right years like back in the day, how it used to be like, oh, a show would go on like nine years. Yeah. Like nowadays the show is like three years, two years and you're kind and of And that's done. it. So I think like, or they're not really doing, you know, back then you would do like 22 episodes of a show. And right now you might do like eight episodes of this show, seven episodes yep. of this show. So it's yeah. just got like, like, you're kind of piecemealing. That's true. A, a, a year of work together. But so it's just different. But I yeah. think as long as there's some more ways to get in, I think that's always good. That's true. That's true. So I mentioned you, uh, Obviously, you're a showrunner on Insecure. Many people don't know what that is. What is a showrunner? So a showrunner, what I would say is like, uh, like a, um, a, like the way like a, uh, in sports, you might have a general manager where you're yeah. like, the person is responsible for like everything, every player on the team, right? So like in my job, everything I'm responsible and, and Issa and I are both responsible for everything from like the, the idea of what the season's going to be from when it's like no, no idea 
till all the episodes are done and we're responsible mm. for everything in between. So we're responsible for like hiring all the writers, hiring all the directors, casting all the actors. We're responsible for breaking all the stories and coming up with the ideas and re- helping writing all the episodes, rewriting all the episodes. Obviously we have other writers in the show. Right, um, yeah. You're responsible for dealing with the network. You're responsible for all of the shooting, all the production, hiring all the crew, putting all the music in, hiring the editors, editing the episode, it, helping them, helping with, you know, you know, working with the marketing department on things like, so you're responsible literally from everything yeah. from like, there is no season four of Insecure to season four is hitting the air. And yeah. everything that encompasses getting it there is what showrunners are in charge of. Wow, wow, that's a lot. So if, so how is, you know, this time of quarantine and obviously the show is, you know, in season four and is up and running and people are loving it, I'm loving it. Um, okay. how, how has this time of quarantine impacted that show? would you say? Or has it? Uh, I, I don't think it's impacted season four because, I mean, we shot season four last year. I mean, it's actually, I mean, we just started season five yesterday. Oh, okay. In, in the writer's room. So it, it's certainly impacting how we're deciding, okay. uh, you, know, you know, how we're balancing how much we're going to involve, you know, the quarantine and the, the coronavirus in the, in the next season because yeah. it's, it's, we're sort of wrestling with, do we want to be like the show kind of exists in a bubble or do we sort of want to be right. like aware and not be tone deaf? So we're figuring out our own balance. Figuring that out. Right. Yeah, so it, it obviously, and, and the, you know, that would say the, the way it's impacted it right now, at least in this, is like the, none of the writers are together. We're all kind of having a writer's room like this. Exactly. So, um, so I don't know how much, it, uh, you know, obviously it'll impact it, but it's not really having any impact on season four because that was already sort of done. Anyway. Right. Well, let's talk about season four. All right. So the the heartbreaking part for me so far is uh, the the development of the relationship between Molly and Issa. You know, it's kind of hit hit a hard spot. Are you team Issa or team Molly at this point? Uh, I'm not really team anybody to be honest. I I think both have fair point of views, and I think that's how we tried to. I think Molly's getting a little bit of an unfair backlash a little bit. Um, you know, when we think about the show, we, I think sometimes audiences think about the show very like sometimes in the moment. Uh-huh. Uh, but when we break the season, we try to take into account all the, all we've seen so far. So like, I feel like people have been sort of like, Molly's like a bad friend. And I go like, well, Issa talked about Molly's, you know, broken vagina see, episode one. In the yeah. Break. And then when like, Daniel and Lawrence were at the fundraiser. Molly ran interference for her. Right. And when Lawrence, she needed to drive back to get the Lawrence, Molly drove her back. And, you know, Molly is there for her. Like, Molly is, like, giving her money. And, then, like, I feel yeah. like Molly's been, like, a really good friend. And so I feel like, but but we take into those, we, we take all that into an account. Right. Like the audience may not, right, like a real friendship over time. The audience may only be taking right now into account. And um, so I'm, I'm not really team, I'm team their friendship. Yeah, me and too. so I think it's sad to like watch, but I think that's what happens when you're like, you know, you've been friends with somebody for so long, you know, where all the bodies are buried, you know, all their mistakes, yeah. you know, and sometimes yeah. you can, I think this is a season where we're watching them sort of take their friendship for granted. Right. Ways, yeah. And, not, and, and thinking it'll always be okay. Right. And learning that, uh, you know, it, it may not be. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, Sunday's episode, of, you know, that just passed. I think we got to see more of Molly's perspective on what, on why the friendship yep. is kind of, you know, from her perspective. I think For sure. the first couple episodes we saw Issa and how, you know, how how she felt, you know, but I think mm-hmm. getting to see the full story, and I'm sure we'll see more as it develops. Um, I know you can't give too much away, but what can we expect in the next episode? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's the block party episode, right? Yeah. So I think you'll see, you know, some stuff <laughs> happen at the block party. All right. I mean, I, love- I mean, we, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, every Chiron is like three months before the black party, two months before the black party. Yeah. So I think you're going to see when she goes like, you know, um, you know, I mean, you're going to see, you're going to see some checks be cashed that yeah. was set up at the beginning. So okay. I, I, I'm curious to see how people will feel, but I don't want to give too much away, but I think uh, some checks will be cashed based on what you've seen so far. All right. I was on your Twitter page and uh, <laughs> a lot of people are complaining that it's only 30 minutes and we got to wait a week for 30 minutes. And I'm like, four, <laughs> I'm like, it's four years. Come on, y'all. It's, it's, a, it's a half hour comedy. So right. guess yeah. it, t- it tells you in the name it's a half hour comedy. Yeah. 
So, yeah. you know, you know, so I, I, but I love that people want to see more, but like, that's not the show. It's not, a, it's not an hour, it's not an hour long yeah. drama. It's a half hour comedy. And so I, I heard that the way that you got, you know, you got on the show is uh, once it was green light to H- for HBO, you reached out to Issa uh, and you reached out to her. Can you tell about that? Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I when I saw that they needed a new showrunner, um, they need they didn't have anybody to help show run the pilot, and um, because Larry, who who co wrote it with her, was getting his talk show at the time, mm. and um, I just I read the script and I was aware who Issa was, and we were we both grew up like we we're both from like View Park area in Los Angeles, and so we we're both from the same neighborhood, and uh, you know there I worked in a nonprofit. Obviously, the show took place in a nonprofit. They were just so. I'm from LA. Yeah. She, I mean, they, 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 there were so many things I, I just could identify about the script that I didn't need to be explained, like what Crenshaw meant, this meant, that meant. Like I was like, that's where right. I grew up. Yeah. So, uh, there was just a shorthand that I think she and I spoke to and understood about LA, and I felt like I didn't know that I didn't think there'd be a better show that spoke to my neighborhood, where I was from, talking about the things that I that I also felt as a black person. And having the experience I had gotten by that point, how I could help Issa. Like, I was like, there's no person that's better suited to do this. And I felt like I could singularly help that. And because I felt like Issa was like a young me. Like, if, yeah. I, was, if I was Issa put into this spot, who would I, what, what person would I want? And who right. would I think help me? And like, I just saw a lot of myself in her. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. I wrote her a letter about why, I mean, we had had, one of my agents was a friend of hers from college. Okay. So I had also worked with Lena Waith, who was also a friend of Issa mm-hmm. when we were on Girlfriends. Like the last season of Girlfriends, like Lena was one of our showrunners assistants. Okay. So, so Lena and I also came up together where I was like a writer. And we, like, we were, I was a young writer and she was a young assistant trying to get put on too. And so we all kind of came up together. And so, so I asked Lena, would she reach out? And, and then my agent was like, you know, you should write her a letter. And I did. I wrote her a letter about what I thought I could bring to it, what I thought could help, what I thought I could do what I loved about the pilot and um, that I wanted to help her. And if she didn't go with me, that I would be a voice for her to help just as a writer in the business. Like, I just, right. like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help. And uh, we met, I think we met for like 15, 20 minutes and we just really hit it off right away. Yeah. And it's been that way ever since. And so, yeah. That's dope. That's dope. I know everyone was devastated. We had to wait a year to, uh, to see season four, but, uh, but no, it was definitely worth the wait. Definitely worth the wait. Let's talk, let's talk about Uncork. So yeah. one, it was one Friday. I was bored in the house. I said, let me see what's on Netflix. Uncork, what's this? The minute I turned it on, I was hooked. I, I, <laughs> I was hooked. I mean, that was, and you directed that. You directed that. What made you get behind this project? Yeah, I mean, at the time when I was uh, trying to figure out, you know, when you work in television, you're often trying to like mimic another writer's voice, right? Like if you write on, if writers write on Insecure, they're trying to mimic what Issa wrote in the beginning, right? right? You're trying to kind of copy every week, you know, you're like, you're like doing that. And so I've been on television shows. And so I felt like I didn't, I didn't know what my voice was yet. And I was afraid. And at the time I was also being asked to like write other movies. A lot of the movies I was being asked to write were like um, sequels or reboots. And I was like, that's kind of, again, copying another writer that kind of set before me a style Right. And I just wanted to write something that I felt one, I could direct, two, that I could find my own voice. Three, I felt like I had just become a father and it made me examine things with my father a little differently and not just see him as, you know, quote unquote yeah. my father, but as just yeah. a guy trying to figure it out. And, you know, my dad was like twenty seven when he had me and, you know, I was thirty something and I had a kid. So I was much more established and entrenched, right. certainly career wise and as an adult wise. And my dad was just like a business owner trying to figure it out. And so it just made me understand him more. Um, mm-hmm. And I wanted to talk about that because I felt like typically in black father son movies, um, it's always that their, 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 their problems are always about the father was absent and never like they just have issues as two men. Like I feel like white counterpart movies like Good Will Hunting or Manchester by the Sea, white people get to kind of have these sort of slice of life right, yeah. fun stories without and just be like, they're just two men that have to figure it out together. And I felt like we don't get to make those movies. You mm-hmm. know, white, white, white people get to be regular all the time. And I was like, black people always have to be exceptional. Yeah. And I was like, we can just be regular too. Cause I feel like when you make people regular, you, it shows more of their humanity and all their flaws than like, and it's no knock to movies like hidden figures or anything like that. But the second you have a movie like that, there's no other counter point of view to the, to the women. 
So yeah. like, because you like, oh, the white people are bad. They're racist. That's bad. You know, the, so the black people have to be good. Right. Like, there's, this that. there's no, yeah. like, there's like, there's no gray right. area. There's yeah. no, there's, there's no like muddiness. Right. And so for me, it's like, those movies are important. And like, that's, that's good. You need those movies. But I feel like the more muddy you make people, the more complex you make them in a lot of ways. And the more you understand their humanity, then they have to become like caricatures of right or wrong or parables, tales of a, like a parable of like, this is the good and this is the bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's where it, it started from. Most definitely. Well, it was a great movie. And I mean, I, it wasn't even on my radar, but once I saw it, I was like, I was telling everybody, I gotta watch this movie. I gotta watch oh, this movie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tell everyone what they can keep up with you. Your Instagram is, is I mean, your uh, Twitter. I love your Twitter. I was reading because you tweet during the show. Um, yeah. They're insecure, and then you tweet about your family and your kids and whatnot. Where can everybody keep up with you? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think my Twitter and my Instagram is all this uh, same. So the underscore a underscore apprentice, the apprentice. Um, yeah, that's where they can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Apprentice Penny, man, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight, and uh, continue to stay safe with your family. I can't wait to watch Insecure Sunday. And uh, for more information, go to our website at stephenishow.com. We'll be right back. After